what makes you tick? Is it the mind? Is it the brain? Or is it perhaps both of them together? The problem when we discuss about mind or brain or the two together is basically who are you? Who am I? What makes me tick? What makes you tick? It's a very peculiar situation. When I ask myself that question, I'm not trying to find out what my gender is, my age, my name. I'm trying to find out something behind all these personal details. S something unique that does not belong to anyone else but me, you. We cannot put our finger on that eye. It's like a shadow, always a pace ahead of you. So the question is, what is this I? Is it located in the brain? Is it located in the mind? Where is it? Most people think of the brain as the main tool for I. It's like a, a series of connections in your head. Cogs, cogs that interact with each other. Nowadays we would replace those mechanical devices with chemical devices, neurons, synapses, etc. But basically the story is the same. However, is I really located in the brain? The famous philosopher Leibniz said one time, if I could walk around in my own brain as if it were in a mill, I would come across all kind of activities, physical, chemical, biological, but never will I encounter a thought. I can never find thinking thoughts in that brain. And when I look at brain scans or functional MRIs, I never find thoughts. A doctor who looks at your brain scans or at a functional MRI cannot see what you are thinking. That's peculiar. That is actually awesome. So when we talk about the brain only, it is basically a mindless brain. There is no mind in there. There are no thoughts in there. Where do they come from? To put it differently, the mind may not be just the brain. The mental may be more than the neural. When a neurosurgeon opens your skull and looks at a monitor, what the brain surgeon is looking at is a neural entity on the monitor. But you are observing two things. You are the one that is looking at the monitor, but at the same time you are also observing something else that is your inner thought processes that no one else has access to. The doc Still many will protest and say, yeah, but isn't all of this a matter of binary code, yes, no, true, false? In a way it is. When you work with computers, you will see that computers work with ones and zeros, on and off, circuits on, off. When you are sending Morse codes, you have short and long codes, binary code. And isn't the brain actually the same? It is on, off. The synapses regulate whether a signal will go from one neuron to the other one or will be stopped. So it's all the same, binary code. So isn't our brain like a computer? I wonder, I really wonder, because all messages, whether they come through the computer, through the Morse code, through our brain, they require something else, a mind. And it requires a mind to read those messages, to read those so it all boils, boils down to the fact that the mind is something behind what we were discussing. It's the eye of the beholder. It allows the human mind to study the human brain. All scientific research, even in neuroscience, may have the human brain as its object. But 
It is only possible to do neuroscience thanks to the human mind as a subject. Without a subject, we cannot study an object. Someday science may understand the human brain, but I think it will never fully understand the human mind, because of the simple fact that science itself depends on the working of the human mind. So, we may indeed understand the human bra brain someday, but I doubt whether we ever will fully understand the human mind, because the human mind is needed in order to study the brain. It requires a mind to understand the brain. It requires a subject to study any object. In other words, the mind can study the brain, but never could the brain study itself. That would be a miracle. That is like a photocopy machine copying itself. The knowing subject must be more than the known object. The mind is the knowing subject must be more than the known object, the brain. Let me prove this in a different way. If the mind were just the brain and nothing more, we would be in real trouble. We would end up in a vicious circle, a boomerang effect. The mind has come up with the theory of natural selection. The mind, yes. Charles Darwin's mind came up with the theory of natural selection. But what did Darwin say next? Natural selection produced the mind. Do you see that we are ending up in a vicious circle? If the Darwin realized at a few points in his life that that's a real problem. He actually said, can we trust the mind that came up with all these beautiful theories if it's the product of natural selection? He had somehow a vague understanding that that is detrimental, that he was cutting off the branch he was sitting on. So let's forget about that relationship. It's actually kind of different. The mind has discovered natural selection, and let's assume that that is a good theory. And natural selection came up with, not with the mind, but with the brain. The brain is a product of natural selection. But if the mind is also a, a product of natural selection, we end up in a vicious circle. So the mind must be more than the brain. I would say the brain is just a vehicle for the mind. The mind uses the brain. So when we find on a functional MRI that certain regions light up, we don't know whether that causes mental effects or it's just a reflection of the mental effects. Is that caused by the mind, or did the brain cause all these effects? It could very well be that the brain is just a material carrier for the mind's immaterial thoughts. I compare it with a radio that carries and broadcasts news. When the radio breaks down, does that mean that the news has been broken down? No, it's just the carrier of the news that broke down. If that's the case, then we have to realize that the mind is in control of the brain, like the news report is in control of the broadcasting radio or TV. But the brain may not always cooperate, because there can be defects in the brain. A coma patient has some defects in the brain. An Alzheimer patient may have some defects in the brain. A child with a Down syndrome may not have the perfect brain. And an unborn baby has a 
brain that is not fully developed yet. Does that mean they have a broken mind? Maybe they have a broken radio, a broken brain. But the news is still there. So they did not lose their mind, but they lost part of their brains. If we identify the brain with the mind, we would have a real problem. But I think I showed you before that that is almost unacceptable. The mind has to be more, has got to be more than the brain. A logical argument that will hopefully convince you. It, it's not my own. It was used by uh, C.S. Lewis. He didn't invent it. He borrowed it from the biologist Haldane. Haldane said, if mental processes are nothing but the motions of atoms in the brain, if that were the case, then we have no reason to suppose that our beliefs are true. Do you feel it coming? Hence we have no reason for supposing our minds to be composed of atoms. If mental processes are nothing but the motions of atoms in the brain, we have no reason to suppose that our beliefs are true. And hence we have no reason for supposing our minds to be composed. So our if statement has been debunked. It does not make sense. But the minds probably not. So how do they act then, mind and brain, if they are two entities? I would say they are two different aspects of reality. The mental aspect is different from the physical aspect. How do they interact? We don't really know. Is that strange? Is that not a weak part? I don't think so. The relationship between mass and gravity is something similar. We don't understand how these two interact. Does that mean they are both nonsense? They are both realities. Similar story for electrical charged particles in an electromagnetic field. We don't quite understand the mechanism behind their interaction. Does that mean they are not both realities? I would say they are. In other words, we end up with the enigma of the human mind. What makes you tick? Many neuroscientists will say the brain, a position that can hardly be held. It's the mind that makes us tick. The brain is not the same as the mind. The mind is more than the brain. Neuroscience is usually not mind science. Mind science is more than neuroscience. And neurosurgery is definitely not mind surgery. This book shows what neuroscientists do, what they cannot do, and perhaps what they should do. You can find this book with a foreword by neurosurgeon Paul Camarato on the website of Solar's Press, Amazon.com, or you can go to the links page of GenesisPC.com.